Let's give our confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Overseas believers and all of us, let us greet each other. Let us leave behind an eternal legacy, an eternal masterpiece, eternal inheritance, and partisan. It is the theme of a WRC. May you be able to meditate on it. May I be able to leave behind an eternal inheritance, masterpiece, and legacy. A legacy, a legacy to leave behind for the posterity. And so you, we must leave behind a, an eternal legacy for our next generation. With this, today's message is entitled, The Core of the Bible. Last week, the World Remnant Leaders Retreat was held at Hannah Church in Daegu. From 50 nations, 2,500 people have come and attended the Remnant Leaders Retreat. And the message was centered on disciple, evangelism disciple, evangelist. And what this eventually talked about was the 24-hour prayer baton and the 24-hour eternity baton. And with that, we must leave behind an eternal inheritance, masterpiece, and legacy. If our message is not spiritual, then you may not understand it, realize it, it won't be graceful, and there will be no deep, there, you will not be deeply moved. In other words, only the disciples of Christ who are born again can understand this message. And therefore, I believe that Yewon Church is a disciple's unity. And so, starting this week, under the theme, Eternal Inheritance, Masterpiece, and Legacy, the 27th World Remnant Conference will be held at Ilsan Kintex. About 1,000 remnants from our church will attend the World Remnant Conference. And so Yewon Church has the most number of participants and attendees when it comes to headquarter trainings. Whenever there's a World Young Adult Retreat, there are about 2,000 attendees, but among the 2,000, our young adults of our church compose 500 of those 2,000 attendees. And people are surprised. So may you, with mission, attend these trainings. When our remnants receive the word, what kind of grace must they receive? Eternally power and eternal mission. And eternal talent is what they must discover. What does this mean? If you believe in Jesus, you go beyond your power, your abilities, and your limitations. So when you look at the remnants in the Bible, when it comes to figures of faith from Abraham to all those who are listed on Hebrews 11, Joseph, David, Samuel, what kind of individuals are they? The Bible names, what are they? The commonalities of them, they're individuals who transcended themselves. They receive eternal answers. That's how you can do the work of God. Eternal. And so when it comes to Acts 1.8, it says when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, how is it that we're able to move others and change history. We can't do that. But God needs to give us the power. And God needs to give us the power, and that power is given to the person of God. And with that power, you do the work of God. But if you don't you have you receive the power of God, then you use your, your own efforts, your own deeds, your humanism, and that's why you get exhausted ex quickly. But if you do it with the power of God, then there is no reason for you to be exhausted and tired. And that's why, like our elder prayed for us today, from now on in the impending future, churches are disappearing. The gospel will disappear. Like Europe, they say, oh, what do you mean, God? You know, that's so low level. That's how the world is moving towards. 
And so even when it comes to developed nations, that's how they have become. You can't even find a church anymore. And in the impending future, that could be true of our nation. We live in the 2080 age, and it will all disappear. And so if we do not believe in Jesus, and what will happen in our posterity? They won't be saved. And so that is the near future. That is that has already begun across the world. And that is why when it comes to our children, we must relay the eternal power, mission, and talent so they may receive what is given from God. Even though they're young, we must be able to raise them as spiritual individuals so they may see everything with eyes, spiritual eyes. If they're smart and if they have great talents, that's all good. But if that child is not spiritual, then they will perish. They will absolutely perish. Why? Because they'll be within Genesis 3, and the result will always be destruction. What should our standards be? Should it be studies, money, fame, and success? It'll all perish. Only those who hold on to the covenant are the remaining ones. They're the remnants, and that is why our mothers, even if you do not know the specifics, if you follow the word and be a person of prayer, and, and you have to impart this into the children every day through family worship. And so what was what was even my mom, she used to always have family worship every single every single day, but that became a spiritual inheritance. And so even if you could sacrifice everything for your children, it's okay, but do not, you must not sacrifice worship. And just because your children don't like worship and because they don't like to go to church, are you just going to leave them alone? If, they, if you leave them alone, they will be, they will perish, even if you were to drag them along. You have to have them sit on in church, even if you were to break an alarm to have them come, because it's the importance of worship. Because if not, then they will perish. And that's what we're talking about, the eternal mission, the eternal talent, and eternal power inside the gospel, inside the covenant, to st have them stand correctly so that we may leave behind the eternal inheritance, masterpiece, and legacy. If you look at Acts 17.1, 18.4, and 19.8, we see that Apostle Paul carried out this ministry centered on the synagogue. And so they went into the synagogue and they and Apostle Paul continuously went into the synagogue and to the young adults and to the posterity. He made the platform for the word movement, the field movement, and the life movement. He went into the synagogues because that's where people were gathered. In other words, our church. must play the role of a platform where remnants can take on covenantal challenges. And so we should not, not merely shout about the three-day weekend age, but we must establish a proper system for relaying the covenant, for developing specialty and restoring the field to bear actual fruits. And this is our mission. When these systems are activated and it bears fruits, then what will be the result? It will, our posterity will stand as witnesses who saved it to their seven nations and 5,000 tribes. Enlarge the place of our tent. We must enlarge it. The, the tent of our thoughts, our businesses, our ministries, 
and all aspects. We must enlarge our faith. May you ask God and the Lord to enlarge your faith. May you hold on to the covenant and enlarge the tent of your ministries. Let us look at today's passage. And it is known as the parable of the vineyard workers or the parable of the wicked tenants. And with this, Jesus summarizes the 66 books of the Bible. Humans who were created, uniquely created in God's image, became separated from Him due to sin. And this is the process of the work of salvation, the history of redemption. It talks about, depicts God's passion, love, and patience for the salvation of mankind, the path to salvation given through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the destruction state of mankind that despite God's love continues on the path to destruction. And so, it, the word of God awaits us inside the Bible. What does that mean? Now, unlike in the Old Testament times when God called individuals by name and gave special messages, He has now recorded all the word He wants to say within the Bible. And that's why to live a life centered on the word is absolute and rightful. And God gives us everything that we need through His word. And that's why like today's message, what is the core of the Bible? And so do you know the core of the Bible or not? Depending on that, it changes your walk of faith. When Israelites became captive, enslaved, and colonized, and when they wandered, what was the reason of that? Why was the chosen nation going through such devastating results and processes? It's because they lost hold of the core of the Bible. And so instead, it would have been better if they were not chosen or if they were not if they had not believed in Jesus. And because then, if you become a child of God, but yet you follow the unbelievers and you are busy looking at what they think, you are called as a light of the world, but yet as elders and as encouragers and senior deaconesses, you are enslaved to unbelievers, then that means you're walking an incorrect walk of faith. What is the reason why individuals are enslaved, ca taken captive and colonized? It's because they have lost hold of the core message of the Bible. Even the Reformation occurred because the medieval church lost this core, stopped being stubborn. People who believe in Jesus, sometimes they're very stubborn. And so what does it say? It says, sola scriptura, return to the Bible only. Adventus, return to the foundation, the source. In short, it means grabbing hold onto what the Bible truly says. 
even today. It's not about my bias, my prejudice. You shouldn't live life that way. What does the Bible say? Even now, many people attend church but lead religious lives because they do not understand the Bible's core message. They do not have the word. They have to rely on the word, and yet they have no word. And so they just say anything, following their emotions, their feelings, whatever they please, whatever they think, without any basis on the Bible and scripture. And when you talk, and the unbelievers in the field there's nothing to even add on to that because they don't even have the word from the first place i bless all members of the yewon church in the name of the lord that you may grasp the bible's core message once again and become main figures of the start 2025 movement and expand the four main tents point number one it is the fulfillment of redemptive history today's passage is one of jesus arguments which he discussed on after he entered Jerusalem. It said, and he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to the tenants and went into another country. Jesus entered Jerusalem to be crucified and the first thing he did was cleanse the temple which had been turned into a den of thieves. At that time, the temple was being used as if a market was rented from the high priest. It was a situation where they were only filling their own subsistence and money under the guise of a sacrifice to God. And because since the Jewish leaders and high priests who had amassed enormous wealth had been cut off from that cash flow, they tried to kill Jesus by finding fault with him. They needed to kill him, but they were so many followers of Jesus. Jesus was too popular. And so no one could touch him. When Jesus tried to cleanse the temple, they came to Jesus and said, with what authority are you trying to cleanse the temple? And that's when Jesus replied with the parable in the passage today. That's what he replied with, with the parable from today's passage. The parable conveys one man who made a vineyard with everything in it and he rented it to the tenants because he had to go to another country. And so after a while, the vineyard owner sent a servant to get some of the fruit from the vineyard. And so the tenants who have been entrusted with the vineyard had to return a portion of the fruits to the owner since they have been given. They had been given the vineyard. However, but they were ungrateful and they beat the servant that was sent to them and just barely keeping him alive and sent him back empty-handed. Nevertheless, the owner remained patient and sent another servant. But then, then the tenants killed him and beat him up. But if you look at the passage, it's not that the owner sent one or two servants, but the owner sent many servants to turn the tenants back somehow so that they may repent, so they may come back. But they did not change at all. 
So lastly, the owner So the owner sent his son because he thought they might turn back if he sent his beloved son. However, these evil tenants, on the other hand, thought the opposite of their owners. The son sent by the owner is an heir, so they thought that if they killed the heir, this vineyard would be theirs, and the tenants killed the son. Jesus says with this parable, what would the owner react when he returns to the vineyard in this situation? Would it be granted that perhaps the owner may bring a large mob or army to completely destroy the tenants and give the vineyards to others again? That's what Jesus said. Who is the vineyard owner in this passage? It symbolizes God. And the evil farmer stands for the Jewish teachers. And the servants are prophets. The various prophets that have come. And the owner's son symbolizes Jesus. And so Jesus was explaining this through the parable. With these parables, Jesus shows the history of humans and how they fell into Genesis 3 problems. After God created everything in the world, He created human beings last and entrusted everything to them. He prepared everything perfectly and gave them everything. And He created mankind in His own image. And that is unique to only humans. And they have infinite power because of that. If you're to launch a rocket to the, to the moon, that's something with, to launch a rocket to the moon is something that only humans can do. And that's because we are created in God's image. That intelligence comes from that. He gave us the privilege to rule and conquer and enjoy everything on earth that He has created. That is how much God loves us. However, however, mankind betrayed this great love of God and fell into Satan's deception that said that we can become like God and disobeyed God's word. Mankind, they remember the words of man easily, but they don't remember God's word at all. They disobeyed His word. They fell into Satan's deception. And they refused to listen to the word of God. From then on, what came? Spiritual problems, mental problems. Stress, neurosis, insomnia, depression, panic disorders. That is what the state of individuals who are separate from God are in. Doctors can't fix it. Nothing can treat it. It's not like surgery can be done. If you are trapped in spiritual problems, nothing, no worldly method can fix it. And because of that, they ultimately go on the path of destruction. In order to be free from such circumstances and curses, God chose one nation to open the way of salvation through that nation. God is love. Because even then, mankind who created in my likeness must be saved. They are deceived by Satan. And they're continuously going on the path of destruction and curses. And therefore, they must be saved. And to save mankind and humanity, the nation that was chosen was Israel. However, the Israelites couldn't, couldn't realize God's will and plan of God. 
and ignore the words of the prophets who were sent by God. And it was not just that they ignored it, but they persecuted them and even in the end killed them. And he, they even killed Jesus Christ who came as the Son of God. And so, the, this parable conveyed that God would eventually judge the crooked Jews and move the blessing to the Gentiles from the Jews. And so that is the message that that light, that blessing was moved from the Jews to the Gentiles. Even today, Jews are engrossed in the belief of being the chosen people. They believe that there is no salvation out aside from them. If you go to Washington, D.C., you see the six million Jews who were massacred and annihilated by Hitler and there's a memorial museum and they have if you go into the museum it shows the footage of at that time where there were even bulldozers that would that would dig up the bodies and you see the shoes that were th that were left behind from the gas chambers at that time. It says to commemorate them, to remember it. Do not forget, it says. What will you do by remembering it? People don't know why that took place even to this day. May you have the grace to realize. You must have the grace to realize. They're still engrossed in this chosen nation mindset. If you go to Israel, they still view us like we're animals. And they don't even serve our food at all because they can't serve the food of the Gentiles. Even after 2,000 years have passed to this day, they're still engrossed in that mindset. However, even amongst these Jews, there are the Messianic Jews, who are Jews who believe in Jesus Christ, and they continue to arise. The Jews who were scattered, they scattered across the world. And among them are those who believe in Jesus Christ, especially in Russia. When they were scattered, many of them went to Russia. And so when they were scattered, many of them went to Russia to live there. And because there were, when they all returned back to the mainland, then many of them were Christians. But persecutions still continue. And I've seen it myself during, when I went on a pilgrimage there on Saturdays. They don't run buses because they keep the Sabbath. And if you try to evangelize, you're, you're kicked out immediately. Even in the field, there are persecutions. But still, the gospel of Jesus Christ's cross is spreading in Israel. Our church also supports missionaries in Israel. It's noted in the church bulletin. Na Naria Community Church and there are Alexander and Na missionaries Alexander and Na Natalia from who served Naria Community Church they came from Russia but the wife is Jewish and so they went into Israel and they are unfolding the gospel movement and that's why we commissioned them I think many believers and members of our church are not aware of this May the Missions Committee provide detailed updates and the bulletin about the mission field in Israel, which is considered the ends of the earth, so that we may pray together for these mission fields. 
it's the ends of the earth. If Israel repents, when Israel believes in Jesus, it's to the point where we say that Jesus will return when they accept Christ. That's how we view Israel. The gospel of salvation that we testify will never cease to be proclaimed. It will be proclaimed until it is spread to all nations. And the important thing is that we are used in the fulfillment of this redemptive history. My family, my household and family line to be used in this redemptive history is a tremendous blessing. God has opened the way through the Start 2025 movement to expand, expand the four main tents. I bless the Yewon unity in the name of the Lord to go all in and focus on this and stand as main figures of answers. Point number two, it's the only hope. Verse 9 reads, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Evil tenants even made a head-on challenge to kill the son of the owner. They missed the chance of the very last patience and their last opportunity of repentance that God had offered to satisfy their own greed. The owner had shown an incomprehensible degree of patience and tolerance to that point. And yet, but yet, they had to destroy the tenants who had refused that opportunity and restored the order of the vineyard by giving the vineyard to others. There is a time schedule of patience. It's not, this earth will not last forever, but there is a time schedule of patience. God remains patient right now, but there is also a time schedule of judgment. It's the Alpha and Omega, the start and the end. If it is he who has created the world, then it'll be him who judges the world. There is an end, and you must remember and know that. Through this parable, Jesus shows that the candlestick of the gospel is moving, is being moved from the ethnic Israel to the spiritual Israel. If you don't realize the gospel in the walk of faith, problems are bound to come. In verse 12, we see that the chief priests, scribes, and elders realized that Jesus' parable was directed at them. But even then, even when they knew that, they knew that Jesus was directing the parable at them, they still did not repent. Oh, the pulpit is talking about me. Oh, God is speaking to me through the pulpit. Then what must you do? Then you must repent. But they didn't do so. They didn't do so. But their hearts only became harder. Their hearts became hardened. All they needed to do was repent. If they had repented, it could have been, but their hearts only became hardened. If your hearts are hardened, you do not repent. You do not go to the Lord and say, Lord, I am a sinner. May you renew me. If you do so, then God would pour new grace upon you, but individuals don't repent. They say they put up their pride. That's what the Jewish people people did. Evangelist D.L. Moody said, the world always serves death's potion in the glittering cup of pleasure. The blessed pleasure of sin is temporary, but the punishment of the unforgiven wicked is eternal. Choosing to forego eternity for a moment of physical satisfaction is the most foolish decision one can make. Jesus finished the example of an evil farmer and made the conclusion with the words of Psalm 188, verses 22 to 23. Verses 10 to 11 of today's passage reads, Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. 
What does this mean? Jesus is revealing that there is a path to restoration for us. Although Jesus was rejected and abandoned like stones thrown out by architects and crucified by the crooked Israelites, it did not end there. The stones thrown out by builders became the cornerstone, it says. This prophecy is perfectly fulfilled by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is a cornerstone? It is a stone that connects the walls of a building. And all bricks start from the cornerstone. Because only when there's a cornerstone can you stack more bricks on it. It emphasizes the fact that Jesus, who resurrected, is the starting point and foundation of our lives. It must all begin with Jesus. If there is no cornerstone, there can't be a house. There must be a cornerstone for the bricks to have a firm foundation to be built upon. Likewise, we shall remember that life without Jesus Christ means nothing. It has no meaning. Only Jesus Christ is the unique hope of all life. It is the unique hope. Reverend George Whitfield, who greatly influenced the Great Awakening in America in the 18th century, proclaimed, If we have made Christ as our leader, there is nothing to despair about. If I have made Christ my leader, if I am truly a person of Christ, if I am communicating with Christ, then nothing should be means for why we must be, be despaired or give up. Are you in Christ Jesus? If you are in Christ Jesus, then you are able to transcend all the environments, problems, and events before us. Can you not fall asleep because of what someone has said? Or are you enraged all night long because someone has said something to you or you've made loss? Come to your senses because if you're in Christ Jesus, then even that will be made good in Christ Jesus. Yes, problems will come. And you may hear this and that. But as long as you are in Christ Jesus, what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? It means that you are in the Word. Because Christ Jesus is the Word. If you're holding on to the Word, if you're holding on to the covenant, then there are no problems. And you're able to overcome and transcend all environmental problems. I bless all believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to look upon Jesus Christ, the unique hope, and have the evidence to stand as historical main figures of the fulfillment of God's redemptive history. This is the conclusion. Now our society is in a serious spiritual crisis. Recently, the Supreme Court ruled that this certain same-sex couple could be granted health insurance eligibility as dependents. And so two men have, be, have uh, gotten married and lived together. And they had won a lawsuit against the National Health Insurance Service asking for the recognition of a same-sex partner as a dependent. This, this shakes the foundation of the male-female family system. And it also shows that the risk of legalizing same-sex marriage has increased that much. Simply put, events that break the principle of creation have taken place. And this, these incidents are 
being legalized in our country as well. And so if you go to the UK and you specify gender, they say that you're discriminating them. You can't even speak of one's gender. That's how developed nations have become. Canada is even worse. And so if the non-discrimination law is passed, if two men come to me and ask me to officiate their wedding, how can I officiate their wedding? How could I? I can't even look at it. But if I say I can't, then I will either be sued and I'd have to pay a penalty or I'd have to go to jail. And if I say only Jesus is the Christ, then I will be imprisoned. Then I will be I will be I would be going against and violating the law. I can't speak of the Bible and claim that it is the only way because that would be going against the law. It's not just this. But shamanism contents are pouring into entertainment programs on local broadcasting channels. On SVS, there's a new entertainment program called Possessed Love. There are eight fortune tellers, young fortune tellers, who are looking for a date predicting their dating fortune. And within that, a shamanic content is very natural in the process. For a while, there has been a craze for personality type test called MBTI. Back then, we used to have four blood types, but now it's not so. But now, recently, apparently fortune telling has become more popular. People just go and have go to a fortune teller. And so apparently there are many people who have gone to see fortune telling or tarot. According to a survey conducted, 45.5% of the 19 to 34 year old group has seen a fortune teller or tarot. And three out of 10 Christians as a whole said they had seen a fortune teller or tarot as well. They are unable to find answers in the church. And because they're so frustrated, they go find a fortune teller who will just tell them straight away. Saints partisan is being built only stronger in the world through culture, through media. The gospel is the only way to break the field of darkness culture of Genesis 3. Only Christ, only the kingdom of God, only the filling of the Holy Spirit. This is the core of the Bible. And that's why I say this to you. When you wake up, you have to say and proclaim, only, may I enjoy only Christ, only the kingdom of God, and only the filling of the Holy Spirit. When you wake up your eyes, confess that. That's how you will survive, because that's the core of the Bible. I bless all ye one church believers in the name of the Lord to destroy the strong bars of Satan with the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the unique hope of our lives, and be the absolute disciples of Christ who enlarge the place of the field's tent. Let us pray. Father God, may all our Yehwan Church believers become spiritual individuals through worship. May they hear God's voice. May they not be stubborn, but may they be able to come to resolution and renew themselves. May they be able to overcome all prompts and incidents with the core of the Bible, which is only Christ, only the kingdom of God, and only the filling of the Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.